Thank you. 
Thank you. 
Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight in this blustery, windy, sunny evening. Uh, I'm Kevin Wright, Executive Director of the Atwood Museum and your host for this evening. We are pleased to present this lecture on migrating shorebirds, but as always, a few housekeeping items before I introduce our speaker. Our next Tuesday talks at the Atwood is scheduled for June 14th, starting at five o'clock. This lecture will be in person at the Atwood Museum, uh, Close Encounters of the Wild Kind, a Cape Cod story with guest speaker, John King. Uh, tickets are now available on our website. Uh, the summer season has begun at the Edwood. Uh, we had our opening day, our opening day this past uh, Friday the 6th and had a very successful opening weekend. We'll be open on Fridays and Saturdays for the month of May. And then we start our summer schedule Tuesday through Saturday, beginning May 31st. Visiting hours will be 10 to four. And for this new season, we are proud to showcase three new exhibits. The Clubs of Chatham, A Century of Summer Leisure, uh, Weird, Wacky, and Wonderful, highlighting curiosities of our collection, and Alice Stalnick, American Regionalist, Beyond the Murals. To celebrate our new exhibits, we'll be hosting a member's reception on Monday, May 16th, from 5 to 7.30 p.m. This event will be free for all our members and $10 admission for non-members. Light refreshments will be served in addition to our stunning new exhibits. So please consider joining us. This year, we're also excited to bring a summer concert series to the museum. Music at the Atwood will host six concerts with a variety of talented performers during June, July, and August. Our first concert is scheduled for June 2nd with Boston violinist Joshua Peckins and, and pianist Iloko uh, Akahori. Details and tickets are now available on our website. For tonight, if you have any questions for our speaker during the lecture, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Brian will respond to as many questions as time allows immediately following the lecture. Enough of my jibber jabber. Allow me to introduce our guest speaker. Brian Harrington is an emeritus biologist from the Manomet Center for Conservation Sciences, where he has been a research biologist since 1971. During his tenure, most of his work focused on shorebirds, sand, sandpipers and plovers, and their migrations, and especially on conservation issues. One species he is especially focused on is the red knot, chosen because it illustrates many of the conservation issues he has documented. Much of his work is described in a popular book, book The Flight of the Red Knot, authored in 1996. Since retirement, Brian has continued his work with knots in Massachusetts, and especially in the Orleans Chatham region of Cape Cod. It is my privilege to welcome Brian Harrington. So that took a little while. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, we hear you fine, Brian. Thank you. All right, All right. very good. Um, well, I've been, I have a long bird driven history of visiting Monomoy and the Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, which dates back to the late 1950s. Uh, and as everyone knows, the forces of wind and water have brought constant change to the size and configuration of, of Monomoy and its surrounding areas, uh, as, and the intertidal areas, as well as the above high tide areas. I have a keen interest in how changes of the Monomoy region 
may have a, may affect its bird life, and specifically uh, to its use by shorebirds. So before getting before launching into that, um, I want to I want to uh, highlight. Uh, the fact that this the Monomoy is a national wildlife refuge, uh, and that it's a, a a major stopover on an international scale uh, for migratory shorebirds heading heading south, and uh, so many of these shorebirds are are well. First of all, what is a shorebird? I expect we have some people watching that are not really bird savvy. And so when we speak of shorebirds, we're, we're talking about sandpipers and plovers, such as these smaller birds in the photograph here and, and the one with the orange bill. Uh, but we're not including things like gulls and terns and, and other birds that we find commonly on the shores uh, of our Cape Cod area and elsewhere. And so uh, when bird people talk about shorebirds, they're talking about sandpipers and plovers, but not the gulls and terns or herons, cormorants, or other things that uh, might be on uh, our beaches. Shorebirds are pretty spectacular critters. Uh, they have absolutely amazing migrations. Many of them are are brown or gray colors, and they're not particularly jazzy looking, but their life is totally amazing. So many of the shorebirds that we have passing through our part of the world are breeding up in Arctic regions of Canada and even over as far west as the Alaskan North Slope. In fact, some from Siberia are coming through our area in south migration. And Cape Cod serves as a place, as a fueling station for many of these birds as they're uh, on their way south. So shorebirds, shorebirds have an unusual type of migration, which is we call a long hop migration. And basically what that means is they, they'll fly a long distance and then they'll stop at a refueling station and they're, they'll refuel and that refueling is building muscle back and then adding a lot of fat uh, to their body, which will serve as a fuel for their next long flight. So for example, a shorebird visiting Monomoy, uh, one of these sandpipers in front of you, uh, might double its weight while it's visiting Monomoy. And then it'll launch out on a flight over the Atlantic Ocean without stopping anywhere. Uh, until it reaches South America. And so this is what we call a long hop migration. And the places where they refuel are absolutely critical uh, to the, their ability to complete these migrations. So for shorebirds, Monomoy is part of a large system of bays and tidal flats that are sheltered by Atlantic barrier beaches. Like most barrier beaches, those of Cape Cod are constantly shifting, sometimes separating into long strings of islets or a long peninsula uh, with tidal flats in behind the beaches. So this provides resources that they, they need, both feeding areas on the tidal flats and beaches for resting during the higher tides. This photograph from 1984 shows Atlantic, uh, an Atlantic barrier beach as a single peninsula coming down uh, the coast of, of Cape Cod and ending at about the latitude of, of Monomoy Island. This ecosystem um, is a very dynamic one constantly shifting, sand is constantly moving, and the feeding places that shorebirds have, the tidal flats, are constantly shifting and changing. This next slide shows a winter view of the Monomoy area. Here, here's the island down here shown 
in 1966 as a single island stretching from Chatham down to the tip. You can actually see Nantucket out in the distance here, the beaches of Nantucket. Um, and a barrier beach, then called North Beach, uh, coming down outside of Pleasant Bay and outside of Chatham and the fish piers in here, uh, and coming down and almost reaching Monomoy Island, but not quite. The, the uh, tidal flats shown in Pleasant Bay and here on Monomoy or near uh, the channel outlet uh, are all key feeding areas for shorebirds. And during the summer, uh, the huge invertebrate animal community blooms with the, um, with the warmer water temperatures and with all the nutrients that are coming in from the Atlantic uh, Ocean. While Monomoy's wilderness is shaped and reshaped by the sea, it remains linked to seafaring history of the New England coast. Native people believed to have inhabited the peninsula six to 8,000 years ago. And the name Monomoy is derived from the Algonquin word for the rushing currents of water that surround Monomoy. And we'll touch on some of the reason for that, but uh, Monomoy on the Atlantic side has about 10 foot tides and on the Nantucket Sound side has only four foot tides. And so here's a blueprint for water rushing around. After World War II, Monomoy became more of a summer playground for beach buggiers, fishermen, occasional nudists, bird watchers, and the like. It also continued to function as a bird mecca, a hotspot for bird watchers, hunters, and sport fishermen. Shell fishing was one of the few remaining commercial activities on the island. The island was taken over uh, by the US government just before World War II uh, and was actually a, a training area for uh, aircraft, uh, aircraft bombing and, and gunning. And it was established as a national wildlife refuge uh, after the war in 1944. So I want to familiarize you with some of the names I'll be using as I move forward. Uh, for shorebirds, the entire region at the elbow of Cape Cod is a system of needed habitats, as I mentioned earlier, uh, tidal flats and barrier beaches. And one of the key elements for shorebirds is the fact that Monomoy uh, Refuge down here is a protected area. And shorebirds need uh, quiet time each day uh, to rest during the high tides. And I'll come back to that later. Um, so um, what we, Pleasant Bay is up here on the north end of this whole ecosystem. Nauset Beach runs down the outside of Pleasant Bay. Uh, the Chatham Fish Pier is about here, Chatham Lighthouse. Uh, the Monomoy headquarters is, is roughly here. Uh, and North Monomoy Island with huge tidal flats at low tide and South Monomoy. It doesn't have so many flats, intertidal flats. It has subterranean flats, but not, uh, I mean, sub under the water flats, uh, but not um, flats that come out at high tide, at low tide. So the key features that shorebirds come to the, this part of Cape Cod for are the tidal flats uh, at which they forage on at low tide. And in this case, we have a, a group of red knots feeding on mussel spat, the little tiny young of mussels, edible mussels, <coughs> excuse me, on, uh, on a flat near uh, the Chatham Inlet. And, and this resource is pretty much available just for, for knots. They, they can only eat the very small mussels. So it's only available to them maybe from July, early July until uh, the late part of August or early September. 
Other shorebirds are feeding on different things, but the same pattern applies. We have this bloom of the invertebrate community during the summer, and then um, uh, it disappears or it gets eaten up, a lot of it. Uh, and in the winter, uh, there's not much of a resource available because most of the invertebrates have gone down deeper in the substrate or they've been eaten. Um, each kind of shorebirds, we, we maybe have 20 kinds that visit this region. Each kind has its own particular feeding manner and, um, it, and each kind has its own particular feeding manner uh, and equipment for, for foraging and finding, finding food. The other, other habitat that's really key for shorebirds is the, um, the beaches that they use for resting at high tide. So the routine of a shorebird when it's visiting a region like Monomoy is to feed at lower tides, whether it's day or nighttime. So in the, if the low tide's in the middle of the night, they'll go forage in the middle of the night. And then as the tide comes in and covers up the flats, uh, they'll go and rest on a, a, a beach that's above the high tide line. So their routine is really dictated by the tide, day or night. Uh, they need to rest at high tide and they need to forage at low tide. So with this, all of this in mind, let's look at how the Monomoy region has been changing uh, through recent decades, and how this seems to have been affecting how shorebirds are using the Monomoy region. Uh, oh, I meant to mention that uh, those undisturbed resting places that shorebirds need at high tide uh, are hard to find. Uh, it's hard to find a place where they can rest quietly uh, and remain undisturbed and have a good sleeping period uh, during high tides, especially high tides in the daytime. So this is an aerial view of, of uh, Monomoy in 2019 uh, with North Monomoy shown here and South Monomoy uh, going off to the south and off towards Nantucket. But this, what I hope you will take note of is the fact that there are huge areas of intertidal flats. Uh, and these are the areas where the invertebrate animals are growing and where uh, shorebirds are foraging at very intense rates during the low tides. They need to remember that they need to double their weight uh, while they're visiting. Monomoy over a two or three week period. Each, each kind is coming at a slightly different period. Each kind of shorebird. So Monomoy is, is uh, uh, basically a constantly shifting, uh, Monomoy and the beaches to the north, it is a constantly shifting uh, uh, piece of land. So just to uh, give you an example here, uh, this is showing Monomoy roughly what it looked like in 1938 to 1958. The island was a single long peninsula uh, attached actually to the mainland at Morris Island, uh, extending roughly 10 miles uh, to the south. This time in it, all of the Monomoy beaches uh, on the east side directly face the Atlantic Ocean. So all of the uh, storms that came in uh, would batter the island and very often overwash the island and wash sand over to the west side of Monomoy, where they, where they became tidal flats and uh, with all the invertebrate animals that it that a shorebird needs. So these overwashes actually are uh, a good thing. We tend, to, we tend to sometimes get alarmed by them, but for a natural process and for providing the tidal flat habitat that uh, shorebirds and 
waterfowl, and gulls, and many other critters need uh, is a good thing. So this to gives you a, a look at what uh, the area looked like in 1952 and then roughly 1978. And so in 1952, Monomoy was still a single island uh, attached to Morris Island. North Beach came down almost to touch Monomoy. The channel for all of the fishing boats was through this area near the north end of North Monomoy. And uh, they would, the anchorage is up here at Lydia Cove. So they had a roughly four mile trip or three mile trip uh, to get out to the ocean uh, from the uh, Lydia Cove Harbor. By 1978, the tip of North Beach was at about the same latitude, so to speak. A winter storm, <clears throat> excuse me, a winter storm had cut through the beach, uh, cutting Monomoy now into two pieces. And it, with a new channel uh, coming right through with new tidal flats developing on the west side of the channel. So note where the tip of North Beach is uh, in this slide. It's, uh, it's gonna move. So at that time, the major feeding areas for shorebirds were on the west side of, of Monomoy. And uh, almost all of the shorebirds that were visiting this region in the 60s and 70s uh, were feeding on foraging on the west side of the island. Uh, between 1978 and 1990, a new inlet from a 1987 storm uh, cut through North Beach and started bringing cold Atlantic water into the southern part of Pleasant Bay and also made for a much shorter trip for the boats from uh, Chatham Fish Pier uh, to come out and get into the Atlantic. At the same time, North Monomoy is diminishing in size as compared to what it was in 1978. South Beach, this piece of land, has now extended south. Remember, uh, in 1978, it was just barely at the latitude of North Monomoy. But now it's extended all the way south uh, towards South Monomoy Island. Now this, this creates uh, a sheltered, an area of sheltered water and new tidal flats with uh, waves coming over South Beach during winter storms, and putting sand uh, into the basin, uh, which become tidal flats for shorebirds to use. One other key point is that uh, the tidal flats of uh, wet of North Monomoy are no longer being re-nourished by waves coming over the island, moving sand into the tidal flat, flats. Uh, whereas all of these flats in what is now called the South Way uh, will, are, are relatively fresh and relatively new and have uh, a very hearty invertebrate animal population. Shorebirds at this time uh, continued to use South Beach or began to use South Beach as their primary resting places during high tide, but also a new little island is forming off to the west that is called Minimoy. Uh, and that also be, start, was becoming a very important place for shorebirds to go for quiet, undisturbed time uh, during the higher tides. Um, so just, I, I wanna reiterate the importance of these resting places. Uh, in in uh, situations where shorebirds are disturbed frequently, they can actually use up the energy that they need to gain uh, for their upcoming migration flight 
And needless to say, uh, the, that can be a real problem for them to complete their flight if they don't have sufficient energy. Uh, so these resting places are very important. And by, the, by 1990, the major foraging places or important, most important foraging places for the shorebirds were these tidal flats in the south way uh, on the landward side of South Beach or on the west side of South Beach. So, and, but some of the traditional areas, especially where the currents come between the two islands and, and are re-nourishing the tidal flats. Uh, so the, the ba major feeding areas were in these two uh, areas where there was active deposit of new sand from overwashed beaches. So, uh, I'm going to show a time lapse uh, series from pictures that were taken from uh, satellites. Uh, and as, as we go through them, and I'll bounce back and forth, but as we go through them, pay attention to uh, how South Beach is extending southward. Uh, that's the beach east of Monomoy Island, North Monomoy. Uh, and also pay attention to how tidal flats, as shown in this picture from 1984, are growing. Uh, these tidal flats that I've got the cursor on are underwater, whereas the tidal flats over here uh, near this inlet are above water at low tide. Uh, and likewise, the flats in the south way here are pretty much underwater in 1984 uh, at low tide. All right. So now we're moving to 1986. And as you can see, the beach has now extended a little farther south. Uh, we're starting to get overwash of those beaches and new tidal flats forming in the south way. Uh, and we're getting new flats over on the uh, near the inlet between North and South Monomoy and near Minimoy. By 2012, South Beach has now extended all the way down to South Monomoy Island and connected up to uh, South Monomoy Island. North Monomoy is now sheltered by South Beach, all of the waters between Monomoy, North Monomoy and South Beach have, new, have tidal flats on them, uh, but they are now uh, not getting inflow of water from the Atlantic. So this whole area now gets all of its water from Nantucket Sound. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the tidal flux, the, the height of the tide uh, on the Atlantic side of Monomoy is on the order of eight to 10 feet uh, during the summer and more during the winter. And, and whereas the tidal flux in Nantucket Sound on this side is on the order of four feet. So where once we had water coming through uh, and flushing Atlantic water, cold, nutrient-rich Atlantic water uh, into these lagoons, so to speak, between North and South, Monomoy and South Beach. Today, with the beach all connected, we just have a lower flush of water coming in from the uh, Nantucket Sound. Now, what, why do I make a point of this? Uh, the nutrient-rich water coming in from the Atlantic is key to having a hearty and large invertebrate animal community. And with the lower tidal flushing and with the warmer water from Nantucket Sound, there, there began to be changes in the invertebrate animal community that the shorebirds depend upon. 
this is just giving completing the series here and showing a, a picture from 2021. Uh, now South Beach has been broken up by winter storms. It's kind of disappearing. Uh, we have lots of tidal flush uh, flow coming in from the Atlantic, and you can see how the tidal flats are forming on the downwater side, so to speak, of uh, what remains of South Beach. Uh, and large tidal flats are forming down in this region also. I haven't talk much about Pleasant Bay, but also at the same time, the breach up at the north end, well, what was through North Beach, uh, this is now the southern tip of Nauset Beach, and this is what's left of North Beach. Um, the tidal flux flow coming in here is also uh, creating very rich tidal flats that uh, are very attractive to shorebirds. So as we, as, we, as we move from the late 1990s into the middle 2000s with South Beach connecting gradually to Monomoy, uh, we had a, a period uh, before the connection uh, happened where there was a very uh, prosperous clamming industry in the South Way uh, between South Beach and North Monomoy Island. But after 2006, uh, that began to diminish as a, as a prosperous clam fishery and clamors began to move up into Pleasant Bay and areas where uh, cold Atlantic water was coming in to nourish the tidal flats. Whereas down here, the tidal flats were not being nourished as much by uh, summer water moving in and out of the area. Uh, this is another clamor. Uh, this is the American oyster catcher, uh, which in this part of the world eats clams. It also eats moon snails and other invertebrates, but uh, clams are, are one of its favorite foods. Uh, I kind of envy them because they can catch them pretty easily. Uh, but this just is, is to give you a, an idea of what's been happening with all of these shifts uh, with respect to this one kind of shorebird, the uh, oyster catcher. So in 1993, uh, when we had uh, uh, extensive flushing of the south way, um, we basically had a very uh, depauperate soft shell clam population. But as this began, as the water began, flow began to diminish in 2003, uh, we still had an inflow and we still had nutrients coming in. But more importantly, we had very extensive tidal flats that would come out, uh, be emerge at lower tides. And these became uh, the principal clamming places for, oyster, for people and for the clam eating bird, the oyster catcher. Uh, and so we had a lot of oyster catchers using monomoy. Some of them we had color bands on. Uh, some of them were coming over from Nantucket uh, after the nesting season there, uh, bringing their young with them uh, because it was such a great place for clamming, both for people and for oyster catchers. But as time went on and the water flow got cut off, in, by end of the South Way, we began to see a decline in the number of oyster catchers. And incidentally, uh, some of the other shorebirds as well, even though they weren't eating clams, they were eating other invertebrates, thrived uh, right along and uh, diminished when the clams also became less abundant. So, in um, in this slide, we're looking at at what has been going on, sort of reviewing. Uh, so since the South Way, this area here uh, became closed, there's been little physical change of the tidal flats on Western Monomoy, West over in this area, and for, and many fewer shorebirds are using these tidal flats now. 
The 2012 inlet is fostering uh, new, new tidal flats and some shorebirds are using that. But the majority of shorebirds are, are roosting on South Beach and now flying up into Pleasant Bay to use the tidal flats up here where we have the inlet bringing in uh, new sand and, and uh, cold water, nutrient rich cold water, uh, which the invertebrate animal uh, community thrives on. And that of course attracts shorebirds. So through time, uh, we have a, a pattern, this is uh, all shorebirds now, uh, where it kind of mimics what we saw in the oyster catcher, except it, that, well, it mimics what we saw in the oyster catcher with basically higher numbers of shorebirds uh, using the Monomoy and Chatham region in the early 2000s and declining uh, fairly steadily as the uh, tidal flats between South Beach and Monomoy uh, became less nourished by the Atlantic Ocean. And then uh, as this slide shows in, nine, in about uh, 2020 or 21, uh, we, the, we got a lot more breakdown of the beach, more nutrients coming into the system, uh, invertebrate communities starting to thrive again on the west side of, of Monomoy and uh, in what's left of the south way. And we start to see an increase in numbers of shorebirds again um, that are using this system. So we have a, uh, sorry, uh, we have a, a pattern here that tells us something about the importance of uh, coastal processes uh, to some of the wildlife that's using our region. The movement of sand and the inflow and outflow of cold Atlantic water is basic to a thriving, having a thriving invertebrate animal community. And that's what's attracting the shorebirds and many of the geese and many of the waterfowl uh, that are using the Monomoy region and Pleasant Bay. So today, uh, as that last slide showed in the graph, we have increasing numbers of, of shorebirds. Uh, our counts are are increasing. Uh, we go out every 10 days during the summer to count. Uh, so the numbers are increasing in our counts. And we're also seeing uh, more shorebirds starting to forage on the flats closer to Monomoy rather than flying all the way up into Pleasant Bay. So North Inlet persists today. Uh, and it's bringing, we have a, a, a wonderful flow of water in and out of Pleasant Bay. It's a little hard sometimes boating out through the, through the inlet. Uh, but for, for, from a nutrient perspective, it's uh, a very healthy system. And finally, <clears throat> as many of you know, Morris Island, with a large break in the beach here, a large breach, Morris Island is now exposed to storm waves coming in from the east and uh, the headquarters of, of the refuge is actually now threatened uh, due to erosion of Monomoy Island. So bottom line, in spite of, or possibly because of constant coastal change, the elbow of Cape Cod remains a strategic migration stopover area for shorebirds. Each year, thousands refuel in the Monomoy system before, before flying nonstop over the Atlantic Ocean uh, in direct flights to Cape Cod. Pretty amazing because some of these birds are barely the size of a sparrow. The refuge is a strategic unit of the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network 
uh, which is a project that aims to protect these key stopover places that shorebirds need uh, during their migrations. There, there are a very limited number of places like this. Uh, each one is a biological engine, so to speak, in its own right, uh, that is producing a bloom of, of invertebrate life that the shorebirds can forage and fatten up on and use to fuel their continued flights uh, north and south. So they're a pretty amazing group of birds. Uh, I've, I've grown to, to, you know, just live for shorebirding and seeing shorebirds. Um, they're pretty amazing animals and I'm just so delighted that we have a refuge at the elbow of Cape Cod uh, that is serving the needs of these birds uh, during their migrations. And so uh, kudos to the United States Fish and Wildlife Service uh, for what they've done uh, for shorebirds and all the other critters that are using Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge and the Chatham region, Chatham Orleans region. And thank you very much for your uh, being here and hopefully some questions to come. Thank you so much, Brian, for your presentation. We do have a couple questions here. Um, we have one from Martha who said that you mentioned counts. Who will continue to do the counts in the future? Well, uh, I guess I should point out that I'm 81 years old uh, and uh, Martha and I are doing counts uh, routinely in the summer. Uh, we're always interested in taking people out uh, to show them the ropes and always hoping that uh, uh, people will carry on doing these counts in the future. I, I should note that um, Monomoy, the counts have been going on at Monomoy since the early 1970s. Uh, Blair Nicola from Chatham and some other people have been key to uh, making all this happen. And, and the counts from this refuge are actually very, very important in uh, helping scientists to understand how shorebird populations are changing on a hemispheric scale. And uh, the sad part of all of this is that the populations are, are declining and, uh, and, and declining very rapidly. And uh, we're about to have a paper come out in which uh, monomoy data will, will play, a, are playing a key, a key part of the analysis. And uh, uh, we're, sadly, we're, we're finding that the populations of many of these different kinds of shorebirds are declining very rapidly. I, went, I answered more than Martha wanted. That's great, Brian, thank you. Um, our next question is from Joanne and she asks, what areas were the birds using while Monomoy was less hospitable? Well, um, you know, the, the, the numbers weren't as high and we don't know if that's because fewer birds were using Monomoy or because as just the same number were using the region, but they didn't stay long. Uh, so the pattern, the pattern when Monomoy has rich food resources is birds arrive and more birds keep arriving every day, but the birds that came the day before are staying and they're feeding and getting fat and so forth. If the foraging uh, habitat isn't so good, they, they, pro they arrive, but they don't stay as long. They leave and, and try and find another place, maybe out in the province lands or maybe towards Plymouth or Situate or New York City area, New Jersey coast, look for other places where they can get what they need uh, before their flight out over the ocean. Great. Um, Peter asks, you referred mostly to Southern migration. Um, but would the mi northern migration be similar? 
No, that's a really good question. And uh, uh, we don't get anywhere near the number of birds during North Migration, shorebirds during the North Migration as we get in the South Migration. And if you think about that for a minute, uh, it's, it's logical. Uh, the, basically, the shorebirds coming down in the South Migration actually crop out a lot of the invertebrate animals that are in the tidal flats. And, and then after them, during the winter, lots of waterfowl come in. They are also cropping the, those invertebrate animal groups. Uh, and by the end of the winter, uh, there isn't as much food available there. And the growing season doesn't really get going until the invertebrate growing season doesn't really get going until June and early July. And so there's not a lot here uh, for a shorebird in May, which is when they are migrating north. So instead, uh, many of the birds that we've marked in the Chatham, Chatham Orleans region are using areas on the mid-Atlantic coast during the North Migration, and especially Delaware Bay, which many people may know about the, the major migration spectacle there in, in May. Okay, um, let me see. Susan asks, what are some of the most common shorebirds that come here? Um, and then is asking if they're plovers. Yes, we have uh, two kinds of plovers that are, are among the more common types that are here in the summer. One is called the black-bellied plover, uh, and the other is called the semi-palmated plover. Strange sounding name, semi-palmated. That, that means the feet are partially webbed, partly palmated. Uh, so semi-palmated plovers. And as most of us uh, no, we also have piping plovers breeding uh, in the chatham monomoy region during the summer. Um, and uh, so that's a, that's a summer resident. The others, there's another 10 or 15 kinds of shorebirds that would be quite common passing through here. Uh, most of them are one type of sandpipe or another. Uh, so there's another 10 or so species that are in the sandpiper group uh, rather than the plover group. Okay. Um, we have a question from Lori. She says, excellent presentation. Is the migratory season fall to spring? Is the migratory season... From fall to spring. Well, the fall migration basically gets going in early July, believe it or not, um, and, uh, and pretty much is over for most of the species by Labor Day. Uh, there are some species that are later migrants, uh, something like a Dunlin and some of the black belly plovers are later and so forth. Uh, and the last, the last of the migrants are usually gone before the middle of, of November. So what spring migration we have is usually from very early May until the early part of June. Okay. All righty. Now we have a question from George. Is there commercial birding access to the prime birding areas of Monomoy or Pleasant Bay? You know, there used to be, uh, it used to be that you could get uh, livery uh, service from uh, outermost harbor uh, to take individual or groups of bird watchers out to Monomoy. Uh, but the flats have become so treacherous there and the water so shallow that they can no longer uh, move in, in and out of uh, the area safely with uh, clients. And so, uh, Back in the early 2000s, when I was working out there, we'd often see 20 or 30 uh, people uh, who've been be all day long to ride back today uh, because people just can't get there without uh, a specialized boat. I have a little light tin boat that I use to, to get in and out there, but I can only I can only be in the uh, flats area of, of North Monomoy for about an hour around high tide, hour and a half. 
Okay. Um, let's see. Christina says, wonderful talk, Brian, and such beautiful images. Uh, aside from the Monomoy and Pleasant Bay region, are there many other areas on the Cape that provide the tidal flats for feeding slash resting areas? Yes, for feeding, especially. Um, there's a lot of a lot of the shorebirds that are spending the high tide resting on Monomoy Island or South Beach are flying across the Cape to feed on the huge tidal flats that are uh, in Brewster or uh, East Ham and uh, Orleans on the Cape on the Bay side. And so there is some like Quimbrel, uh, which is a, a large shorebird with a decurve bill uh, that do this routinely. Uh, they, they'll, they fly some of them all the way to Provincetown probably uh, and, and then come back at night to roost on, on Monomoy, uh, which, which they, you know, can, they know it's not going to be disturbed and they know it's too far away from the mainland for horned owls to come and grab them in the middle of the night and so forth. So, um, uh, that, um, uh, movement, basically a shorebird will not go farther than it needs to, uh, to get good foraging. And so, as I kind of hinted, they, they're not moving up into, into Pleasant Bay so much today because they can almost walk from their roosting places on South Beach or uh, Minimoy Island to tidal flats that are now rich with food. Uh, and, and to a shorebird, a walking to a feeding place is just happiness. They don't, they don't want to fly and use energy uh, to travel a long distance when they can get it nearby. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. That uh, pretty much wraps up our questions that we have from our viewers. I'll pass it over to Kevin now. Thank you very much, Caroline uh, and Christina for keeping things going behind the scenes. Brian, very fascinating talk. I do have a quick question myself. Um, you've been doing this for a while. What got you interested in shorebirds? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> that goes back to childhood. And um, uh, it, so when I, when I was a little kid, I lived near, near the coast. And uh, in the summer, I, I took a fascination for the shorebirds that were on some of the rocky beaches uh, near my home. It was just you know, an odd one here or there, not, not big flocks. And as I reached middle teens, uh, I, I began to realize that there were places like Monomoy where there were thousands of shorebirds. And uh, I used to try and persuade friends to drive me, you know, the Cape so I could see this amazing spectacle or to Newburyport uh, up near the New Hampshire border uh, is another major stopover place. Uh, so in any case, I don't know why I took a fascination in shorebirds versus other birds. Uh, I like all birds, and I'm a bird watcher and love, love uh, looking at all of them. But my fascination with shorebirds, I think, was maybe because of the, you know, I was tickled by the amazing migrations that they have. It just tickled my imagination. Uh, and I read a, a, a little pamphlet that was put out in the 1950s that really caught my imagination about uh, migration of shorebirds. And then I read a book um, on uh, the Eskimo curlew, the migrations of the Eskimo curlews and, and the extinction of the es Eskimo curlew by Fred Bodsworth. And uh, uh, that had a huge impact on me. It, I don't know, when I was 14 or 13, something like that. That goes yeah. back a long ways. Yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. Do you ever uh, check out other shorebirds at, uh, at different coasts uh, down in Florida, or, or is it mostly just in Cape Cod that you do, do your enjoyment? Oh, no. Um, uh, I actually, at, at, with my work, uh, I, I worked as far south as, as you can go. Uh, in Argentina. So 
so some of my work with the Red Knot took me to uh, Tierra del Fuego and coast of Argentina, and Venezuela, and, you know, lots of other places. Uh, so even today, though, I, uh, Martha and I just got back from Colombia where uh, we were bird watching for three weeks. So I, I, oh, nice. I travel uh, for bird watching as much as I can. Very cool. Well, Brian, thank you very much. This is very fascinating, and we're so glad you took the time to talk to our our, uh, our attendees today about shortbirds, and uh, uh, we wish you the luck. If anybody has any further questions for Brian, uh, his uh, email address is at the bottom of his screen there, and I'm sure he'll answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, and uh, please uh, make your plans to uh, come and visit us at the museum. And uh, again, Brian, thank you so much. Okay, look forward to that and thank you. Good night. <laughs>